All right, guys, it's not every day we go onto YouTube and actually find someone that goes and openly admits that they were wrong. What was I actually wrong about? Well, let's talk about it. Hey guys, Turk here. I hope you're having a great day. If you guys are new to the channel, I appreciate y'all stopping by. And for all you members of the Turk Force, thanks for coming back by. Today, we're gonna to be talking about processors and primarily between six cores and eight cores. Now, I have reviewed a whole bunch of different types of processors here on the channel. We've covered the Ryzen 3000 and the 5000 series, and we've even touched a bit on the Intel 10th gen and 11th gen processors. Overall, my general recommendation when it comes to processors is to go with the eight core option, even if it is an older part, because it strikes a better balance when it comes to application performance as well as gaming performance. However, over the past couple weeks, there's been quite a bit of Twitter drama going on between tech deals and hardware unbox, where they're duking it out on what's gonna be actually better, fewer, faster cores or more slower cores. Now, I've got my personal opinions and rather than let my own bias pick aside, Let's put it to the test and put some factual numbers behind the arguments in order to determine what's better, six cores or eight cores. So in order to do that, we need a test setup. Now, gotta be honest guys, my Intel test bench has been rather lonely lately. I've put a link up at the top right. The Intel 11th gen is just not all that exciting, but I've got the hardware to do the test. So we're gonna be pitting the 11600K versus the 11700K. So these two parts, they're actually quite similar when we take a look at the spec sheet. Now the 11600K is going to have six cores and 12 threads while having access to 12 megabytes of the smart cache. Now, once we get into clock speeds, the base clock is gonna be 3.9 gigahertz and the boost clock speed is going to be 4.9 gigahertz. Now going over to the 11700K, it's going to have eight cores and 16 threads while having access to 16 megabytes of smart cache. We're gonna actually get a slower base clock speed of 3.6 gigahertz, but the boost clock speed is actually 5.0 gigahertz. Now, if you go finer into the details, like if you go into the Intel Arc website, there's a couple of different uh, boosting features available to the 11700K that just aren't equipped with the 11600K. So on paper, it sounds like the eight core part has the advantages here, but is this going to actually pan out when it comes to actual gameplay? So the CPU selection is only half the battle in today's comparison. So now let's talk about the graphics card. Now, of course, a lot of people like to throw their top tier graphics cards into the mix for their CPU comparisons. That way they don't have to worry about any type of GPU bottlenecks. But a lot of you guys don't have RTX 3080s just lying around for gaming. And y'all might be relying on some of those older, you know, mid tier, lower tier graphics cards into your mix. So I've got two graphics cards for y'all to look at today. Of course, we have to use the RTX 3080 because we've tested it with our mining rigs, we've tested it with all sorts of different gameplay, but when it comes to that middle range graphics card, I had to do a little bit of digging. Fortunately for us, the RX 5600 XT, it's a very good 1080p card for in most cases. It's even able to stretch its legs when it comes to 1440p. Again, looking back at our GPU tier list, the 5600 XT is about half as powerful as the 3080. So I think it's gonna be able to put a couple of different bookends for our comparison today. We've got the six core versus eight core, and we've got the mid tier versus the top tier. We're gonna be testing these all in combination and hopefully getting a clear picture of which of these processors is better. I'll post the rest of the test setup down in the description below. Now, the next critical thing to talk about here is the game selection. So we're gonna be testing the whole gamut of things when it comes to GPU bound games, CPU bound games, and games that have a pretty good balance when it comes to overall system optimization. And that's gonna include games like Hitman 3, Warzone, Rainbow Six Siege, Cyberpunk, Doom Eternal, and Crytex forward-looking Neon Noir benchmark. Now that we've got all that on the table, let's see which of these core configurations is actually better. The first chart we're looking at today is going to be the RTX 3080 at 1080p. Now with the eight core part on Rainbow Six Siege, we are able to get right at 392 FPS, followed by Doom Eternal at 326. Now with the rest of the games, we start to see kind of a linear slope. And with Hitman 3, we're able to get 233 FPS, and Shadow of the Tomb Raider 168, Metro Exodus 150, Gears 5 133, and Red Dead Redemption 2 at 117. Fortunately for us, all of the games here are above 100 FPS, which is pretty good, but you know, for an RTX 3080, we wouldn't expect anything less. Now, if we go and look at the 11600K, the six score part, 
I'm actually quite shocked to see that we have such similar numbers. Now with Rainbow Six Siege, we do drop by about six FPS and <laughs> Doom Eternal, we drop five. But overall, the slopes and the uh, trends here are actually very close. Now, when we take a look at both of these processors from a percent improvement perspective from the 11600K, I'm pleased to see that most of the games on this list do in fact favor the eight core processor. However, there is a fine detail here that you might have missed. If you look at half of these games, they are within plus or minus 2%, which could be considered within the margin of error. And if we look at that from a holistic perspective, if we're at 100 FPS and you're shy by 2%, that's only what, 98 FPS? And if you go the other way, you're only gonna be at 102 FPS. So when we look at the raw FPS comparisons, I'm really not all that impressed. Doom Eternal, we again only get five additional frames with the eight core part. Call of Duty Warzone only gets about seven to eight FPS improvement. And in the most extreme situation, Shadow of the Tomb Raider does gain 12, which is quite noticeable. Shifting gears to the higher resolution at 1440p with the same detail settings, we do see similar trends with both Rainbow Six Siege and Doom Eternal performing very well and a linear slope going down the rest of the games. However, we are eerily close when we compare these side by side. GTA 5 is getting right at 146 FPS, Crisis Remastered at 109, and with the six core parts, even Assassin's Creed Valhalla is right at 85 FPS. Converting this into a percent performance improvement compared to the 11600K, I gotta say guys, all but two of the games here are within that plus or minus 2% margin window. Now, since we are at 1440p, the margin of error could be a little bit closer, but I do see a really strong balance here when it comes to both the eight core and six core parts being able to drive the RTX 3080. Now let's see what happens when we put in a less powerful graphics card. Now it shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone, but with the 5600 XT, we are starting to pivot to a more GPU limited scenario in many of the games today, but we are still able to get some pretty impressive performance. Now with Rainbow Six Siege, we're at 233 FPS with the 11700K, 181 FPS with Doom Eternal. Now, as we go to the remainder of the games, we start to see a pretty linear slope with GTA 5 hitting around 130 FPS, Hitman 3 with 124, Call of Duty Warzone 109, and then Assassin's Creed, we're getting right at 78. So a pretty, pretty decent performance from this lowly graphics card. Again though, now that we take a look at these six core parts, these graphs look very similar. We do have the same scaling at the bottom, so y'all can go back and forth on the timestamps if you want, but we are very close. Doom Eternal, again, 179 FPS, Hitman 3, 124, Crisis Remastered at 84, Metro Exodus at 75. So guys, both of these processors are able to max out our 5600 XT. Now let's take a quick look at the percent performance improvement. As we saw with the RTX 3080 at 1440p, the 5600 XT at 1080p actually shows a pretty good balancing act when it comes to the performance improvement. In fact, most of the games actually see less FPS as the six core part. However, we are still within margin of error in most of the games in today's comparison, and Crisis Remastered is the largest difference here when it comes to a percent performance. And if we take a look at the raw FPS difference between the eight core and the six cores, we are within plus or minus two FPS on all of the games in show today, which probably is not gonna be noticeable by most gamers. 1440p is a very difficult resolution for the 5600 XT to manage. However, with AMD's Fidelity Super Resolution on the horizon, this is a good chance and indicator of just how well AMD's upscaling technology could make this graphics card shine. But going back to our main topic today, six cores versus eight cores, I'm starting to echo myself quite a bit here, and we are seeing very similar performance between the 11700K and the 11600K. Now, I am pleased to say that we are able to get above 60 FPS in half of the games today, and the other half of the game includes some very graphically intense titles. In fact, if we go to our percent difference from the 11600K, we are again within plus or minus 2% for all but one of the games, and we are in fact favoring the six core part in many of those different instances. So we are clearly GPU bound in this scenario, and there are instances where having less cores could give you a bit of a better performance. 
All right, so let's merge all of these games and figures together and see if we can come to a high level kind of summary before we go to the rest of the video. Now, in general, with the RTX 3080 at 1080p with the eight core parts, we do in fact, on average, get a 2.4 percentage point improvement with the additional two extra cores. However, though, if you look at the other graphics card as well as the other resolutions, guys, we're within like 0.5 percentage points between the better result and the worse result on average. So I could even argue that you're not even gonna be able to tell the difference with the lower end graphics cards or if you're gonna be increasing your resolutions in your gameplay. Now, now guys, I find that actually quite shocking. Now I game at 1440p in most cases, and if I'm able to go with a six core part instead of an eight core part, that's a lot of money that I can dedicate to other components of our build. But before we jump to that conclusion, let's actually see what's going on underneath the covers, and that's talking about CPU utilization. Now for this analysis, we're only gonna be looking at Call of Duty Warzone because as we saw with our DLSS bottlenecking video, there were several instances within our little downtown test loop where we saw that CPU utilization skyrockets and that could be impacting our frame rate. Now, I don't have all of this data for all of the different games, but for us, we're gonna be comparing the 3080 and the 5600 XT only at 1080p. Let's see what's going on. First, let's take a look at the RTX 3080. Now the blue lines we have here, both the dark and the blue line, those are gonna be our eight core parts and the yellow lines are gonna be our six core parts. Now over the entire run, we do see a good distribution of both high and low frame rate scenarios. However, with the eight core part, it is slightly ahead in most instances, though there are a few bumps where the six core part is better performing. And what I find really interesting here is just how well each of the lines actually track with one another. Now, if we look at the bottom half of the graph, we get to actually focus on the CPU utilization. And you'll notice that the eight core part in blue there, it actually averages right around 50% utilization across the entire run, while the six core part runs around 70%. If you're running heavy tasks in the background, such as encodes or Steam surprises you with a surprise update, this could be an issue. Keep in mind with this level of processor utilization in play, we're actually running both of these processors at the same average frequency, which further proves that this is a great core versus core comparison. Now we're using the same formatting as before, and we do see the same FPS Valley as with the RTX 3080. What is surprising here is just how well the FPS numbers track, proving the repeatability of the test loop. Also, we actually can confirm that our average FPSs are right on track with what was reported. As for average utilization, the eight core part sees roughly 40% in utilization, and the six core part bumps up by about 56%. This suggests as we shift from a GPU limited scenario to a CPU limited scenario, we should expect to see a 15 percentage point increase when it comes to our CPU utilization numbers. So this really got me thinking. The 11th generation parts are brand spanking new. They came out early 2021. So what if you guys are sitting on some older generation hardwares like the Zen 2 architecture? So now we're throwing in the surprise competitors, the 3600 versus the 3700X. Now the Zen 2 parts, they're not as fancy as some of our Zen 3 parts. They don't get some of the impressive IPC performance improvements or those single threaded boost clocks, but they are a pretty good recommendation. And a lot of people have recommended the 3600 and I myself have recommended the 3700X in many different occasions. Now they're both gonna be rocking 32 megabytes of L3 cache and they're spec'd at a 65 watt TDP. The six core part is only rated for 4.2 gigahertz and the eight core part is gonna go up to 4.4 gigahertz. Now Zen 2, it doesn't boost as well as the Zen 3 parts, but I did see in my testing that with the six core part, we were getting right around 4,100 megahertz. And with the 3700X, I was getting between, you know, 4,250 and 4,325. So we do in fact see some frequency improvements going forward. Now, I'm a little short on time, so I'm not going to be able to run these two parts through the entire gamut of the tests. So we're going to be focusing on 1080p as well as both of the different graphics cards. And I'm only going to be looking at a handful of games, the ones where we saw uh, the most CPU improvement going between six cores and eight cores. Starting off with the RTX 3080, guys, I'm shocked, but we are actually seeing very similar trends that we saw with our 11600 and 11700 K parts. You know, we're not able to get as impressive frame rates because we are running at lower uh, frequencies, 
but I am still impressed. We are above 100 FPS in all of the games, and both the 6-core and the 8-core parts are performing just as good. And if we pivot over to the 5600 XT, I'm echoing myself again, guys. This is really outstanding performance. We're able to see pretty much identical performance across all the different games, and I even see a little bit less variance. Now let's look at both of the different companies comparing the eight cores versus the six cores. So the bottom half of the chart here, we've got the 3700X compared to the 3600X, and the top half of the chart, we have the 11700K compared to the 11600K. Now, what I find amazing here, guys, is we see almost identical FPS improvement going between six cores and eight cores, regardless of the year the processor was released or the brand of processor that was released. We see relatively similar FPS improvements across the board, and we do see at 1080p with the RTX 3080, much better improvement with the 11700K. But when it comes to the 5600 XT, the 5600 XT actually prefers the 3700X, though these raw FPS numbers are <laughs> pretty irrelevant at this point. GTA 5 with a 2.7 FPS improvement? Like, who really cares? That's really close to being uh, within the margin of error. All right, so let's put each of these processors up side by side with each of the different graphics cards, and let's compare them all by game. In Shadow of the Tomb Raider, we see classic GPU bottlenecking with the 5600 XT, but we do see CPU bottlenecking from the AMD parts on the RTX 3080. However, adding additional frequency helps the Intel parts improve and leverages the cores better, though it's not by much. In Rainbow Six Siege, we see a similar bottleneck transition as Shadow of the Tomb Raider. However, instead of favoring cores, we favor the extra 400 megahertz with the Intel parts. We see a similar transition with Metro and to a certain extent in Crisis Remastered. GTA 5 brings forth some traditional CPU bottlenecking, However, the extra frequency from Intel does leverage the GPUs a bit more, but not as much as one would hope. As for core count, the improvement, it is minor. Taking a look at Crytek's benchmark, it changes things up a bit. If we have a good enough GPU, the benchmark will utilize the extra cores and frequency, resulting in some pretty decent scaling. <laughs> Overall, guys, I am shocked with just how well the six core parts are able to handle themselves in the grand scheme of things when it comes to gaming. Now, what's even more fascinating is with the older generation AMD parts, we saw similar FPS improvements as well as similar trends in some of the games that it's just really shocking just how well things are scaling in the six core versus eight core debate. In fact, this brings back the debate between hardware and box and tech deals when it comes to, you know, fewer, faster cores versus more slower cores. Looking at the 11600K versus the 3700X, sure, the 11600K wins by a fairly large amount. However, is that amount of winning really worth it? It could be the difference between maxing out your panel's refresh rate or having to reduce quality settings for the pure gamers. But if any application or production work is necessary, I am definitely in favor of adding in the two additional cores. <laughs> All right, guys. I've got to admit, throughout this entire video, I have been heavily conflicted, but I'm really glad that I've gone and done the legwork in order to come to some new conclusions. Now, I'm happy to admit that I was wrong that in certain instances, eight core parts just aren't good, and I do highly recommend for pure gamers, six cores is the better option. However, I still do stand by my recommendation of eight core parts whenever necessary, especially if you're doing time sensitive work such as uh, encodes, code compilation, or any type of content creation. There are several benefits of having the two additional cores, but for the most part, gaming, it just isn't one of them. And that's gonna be the video today, guys. I hope y'all have enjoyed it. If y'all have stuck around to the end of the video, welcome to the Turk Force, we're glad you're here. Make sure you follow me over at Twitter, post all sorts of memes and news over there. That way you can get in contact with me directly. And guys, if y'all have been following me on Twitch, I've been taking a little bit of a break for, uh, in order to do some family stuff. But guys, we're gonna be getting back into the big swing of things on August 19th with QuakeCon at home. We're gonna be streaming live from my buddy's house. We've got a LAN party all going on. So that's gonna be a really good time. So make sure you subscribe down below, hit the follow button over at Twitch, because guys, the Turk Force is getting back in action. So I appreciate y'all stopping by. I hope y'all have a great day. We'll catch you in the next one.